Hello, everyone. I'm Lee from First Person Safety, and here today I have my good friend, John Hearn. And John and I are going to talk to you about motor programs. Uh, but before we do that, we should probably introduce John. John, introduce yourself and tell everybody about you. Hey, guys. My name is John Hearn. Uh, I guess I'm here today because I have this interesting dual career going on. Been a law enforcement officer since 1992. Been teaching firearms in the professional firearms training business uh, for over 20 years now. Uh, staff instructor with Range Master. Uh, most relevant here, I've done a lot of research and digging and have a, an eight to nine hour talk that I do on human performance under stress. Uh, and I guess we'll be talking about some of those points. I think Lee's seen the presentation, suffered through it at some point. So I guess Multiple he, times. he suffers well. <laughs> All right. And you are also a graduate of Four Science, if I remember correctly. I am a Four Science Institute graduate, their basic uh, Four Science Analysis program. All righty. So I guess the first thing we should do is tell everyone what motor programs are. Well, at the most fundamental level, uh, motor program is just a set of instructions for your muscles to perform a simple task or perform a certain task. Uh, in the most basic form, I think we can state that. It's a set of instructions to get something accomplished. Okay. And typically you hear this referred to by people sometimes like muscle memory or whatever, which doesn't actually exist. But is that what we're talking about here? It's in that same region, you know, uh, you know, motor programs. We can talk about motor skills. A lot of people have heard of fine and gross motor skills. Very, very closely related concepts uh, as far as that goes. Um, you know, muscle memory is, is, is one aspect of it. A lot of people get upset about that word, uh, that expression. Uh, it's in common enough use and people understand what it is. I just let it slide by. That's not one of those skills I'm going to die on. All right. As our friend Dave Spalding may see this, folks, the correct term is familiar task transference. All right. So, John, what does it take to build a motor program? Uh, so, on a meta level, like on a huge level, obviously, you've got to have an interest in the subject. You know, it's very hard to build a motor program in something you just don't care about, right? So, just a motivated student would seem to me to be a necessary prerequisite. Um, and at some point, you're going to need a set of instructions in order to do that. Uh, those instructions should probably come at you from different levels. Uh, for instance, uh, we have a large section of our brain that does nothing but learn from the actions of others. So they're referred to as mirror neurons, right? So a good set of uh, instructions would probably include an explanation of what you're trying to accomplish, uh, a demonstration by the instructor, uh, then breaking that motor task into a series of discrete steps, probably practicing those discrete steps uh, one at a time, and then slowly trying to smooth those together. As part of that, you would need a, a well-qualified coach that would be watching this entire process, uh, fixing mistakes as soon as they crop up. And then ultimately long-term, we would need to consolidate those motor programs for lack of a better word, and get periodic review from a coach to make sure errors haven't crept in. Okay, what are we looking at in say the estimated number of repetitions, correct repetitions it would take to successfully build a motor program? So that's going to vary uh, on, based on several factors. First off, uh, people vary in how quickly they learn motor programs. People who we think of as naturally gifted athletes would be someone that we think of as a very high level of kinesthetic intelligence are going to learn motor programs more quickly than others. Also, uh, how quickly you learn a motor program is just going to depend on the program itself. Is it a very simple task? Is it a complex task? Obviously, the more complex a motor program, you're trying to learn the longer it's going to take to learn it. Uh, some good general ballpark figures here, and just speaking very generally, is it will probably take three to 500 repetitions to establish that motor program. Now, the caveat to that is, of course, is that's just to build the basic program. Uh, if it's a really important program, we're going to have to keep it updated so it doesn't go away. We need to fight the effects of what we call recency. And then if it's really, really important long term, we probably need to automate that motor program. So learning the motor program isn't a big deal. Three to 500 repetitions uh, can probably accomplish that. Now, making it part of your existence is going to require a much greater number of repetitions. All right. Since you touched on automating, uh, explain what automaticity or millenniation or overlearning is and basically what would it take to achieve that level? So uh, when somebody does something, um, at, you know, shoots really well, I think would be a really good example. They have actually had to make physical changes to their brain over a period of time in order to do that. Uh, anytime we use a particular neural pathway again and again and again, the 
body will actually de uh, deposit this material called myelin, which is effectively an insulating sheath along that neural pathway. That myelin uh, creates kind of a super highway for that nervous impulse. So over time, the nervous impulse actually travels faster and faster. So when we talk about myelination, we're actually talking about making a physical change to the wiring of your brain to make those nervous impulses travel faster. Now, obviously the best way to do that is this concept of what we really refer to in the literature as overlearning. So if I basically can teach you to perform a task once and you do it completely, we consider to have learned that task. Uh, anytime we train above that basic level of mastery, that's considered overlearning. Now, it's going to take a lot of overlearning to automate um, what we're trying to do, but our ultimate goal is as we myelinate, we reach what we call a point of automaticity. Uh, automaticity uh, has several common definitions. Uh, the one that I particularly like is uh, quite simply this, it's one step from stimulus to response. Uh, that's automaticity. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about functioning on autopilot under high periods of stress. That's what they're probably doing. They're functioning in a state of automaticity where they're not having to make a lot of conscious thoughts as far as particular actions. They're not sitting there going, hey, I need to get a firing grip on the gun. I need to work through the process of my presentation. I have to bring the gun up. They have simply chunked all of that information together into one, one action, which is respond, which gets the gun out of the holster automatically, uh, remove the mechanical slack from the trigger as the gun comes up, visually confirm the uh, sights are where they need to be and press the trigger. For a, a seasoned shooter, that's not discrete steps. That's just one large operation. Uh, we call that whole process chunking. You know, we can add more and more to that to that it only is, it's literally one step from that stimulus to the response. So that's ultimately what automaticity is. Uh, I like to liken it to driving. When you first started driving and you, and you sit in the driver's seat and you had to think through every step, okay, I have to press in the brake so that I can move the gear shift from part to drive or like I learned on a stick shift, so I had to do much more than that. But, you know, those type of things where now people really shouldn't be doing it. But, you know, they've gone from that to they're driving down the road with one hand on the steering wheel, texting, doing something else, having a phone conversation or whatever, because they're really not having to think about the process of mechanically operating the vehicle anymore yeah. because yeah. they've done yeah. it so much. Yeah, the other example I like to use, is I think most people might be familiar with a, a simplex lock. That's like a mechanical lock where you push buttons in a certain order. And literally for years, like probably 10 years, we had the same code on the door at work. But when I approached that door, I didn't sit there and carefully think I have to push this button, this button, this button. I just simply told my mind to open the door. I could be conducting a conversation and the correct number just automatically went in with any conscious thought. Now, what was really ugly was when they decided to change the combination on that simplex lock that had been ingrained for 10 years. That's when it got really ugly because I had to, you know, I no longer could just say, you know, tell my mind, the subconscious to open the door. I had to literally sit there and think, what did they change the code to? Look and see where the, each number was and then press the right number. You know, those are, those are fundamentally different experiences. They're the same thing, opening the door, pressing three numbers to gain that, but they're, they're fundamentally different experiences at the performance level. Uh, similar things will be changing the passcode on a cell phone or changing the password to your computer. Yeah, absolutely. Stuff that, you know, you get just get used to doing out of habit. All right. So what is primacy? Uh, primacy is a learning concept primarily that basically the, the way you learn to do something first is going to be the brain's preferred way to do that. So it'll probably be, tend to be the way that you automatically default to. All right. Um, I, I'm, I'm getting a message from my producer in the truck that we actually have video of someone who has learned a certain technique to the point of having automa auto automaticity and then they're in a class doing it really well trying to learn how to do a different technique. I think we need to show the viewers this video. What do you think? Uh, I knew I knew this video. Was <laughs> so you feel free to insert it and laugh at my expense. You've done it many times. <laughs> Hopefully it's playing for the viewers.
I don't know who you got for that video, but he was certainly a handsome looking fellow. That's all. I <laughs> well, I think it's a good example of what we're just talking about here. Uh, folks, John is a very skilled uh, pistol operator and uh, he's from the range master school of thought with a handgun and he has legitimately, uh, you know, burned in, overlearned, whatever phrase you want to use, the overhand method for uh, clearing a malfunction or running the slide on a pistol. And uh, John and Tom Gibbons and I went to a Dave Spalding class specifically to learn and, and see what he was teaching with his inboard manipulations. And that was John knew, you know, before that, if the video started, he would have told you, well, I'm going to do the inboard manipulation. And as soon as he hit that malfunction, he went right back to what his brain knows the best, what his brain had learned first. Any commentary on that, John? No, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I've practiced that a number of times. I've demonstrated it. I mean, it's basically, uh, what would you think of that was a, a classic double feed clearance? And I've practiced that enough on a good day. I can do it in about four seconds using the method I'm, you know, the most familiar with to do that. So that's, that's a pretty good time. It shows you how much I put some effort into practicing that. And uh, as soon as my brain realized I had a double feed, it ran the default double feed program that uh, I had, you know, my first probably professional firearms training exposed to that was probably 1999 which is becoming a depressingly long time ago. So that's about 22 years of practicing in a particular way, then trying to fix that, you know, on the fly with, uh, with my supportive friends videotaping it, just waiting for the wheels to fall off. Well, you know, you did say friends, so that, there you go, right there. What, you know, your friends, friends are, yeah, your friends enjoy your screwing up more than anybody else does. Um, you know, just, just to go back on that technique there, um, I've burned in the overhand technique as well. And if I tell myself before I go to demonstrate or to go to clear a malfunction or run the slide forward on a reload or whatever, then I'm going to do the inboard technique, then I can accomplish the inboard technique. If I just do it on my motor program, I tend to default back to the overhand, even though from what I've learned on, on the clock, I tend to be a little faster with the inboard. So I'm trying to, um, reprogram my brain to do that but that's a lot of reps and a lot of promise that i've got to overcome so that leads us to the next question then what does it take to override a program that you've already written so the uh there, the common number thrown out there is three to five thousand repetitions to fix a motor program uh, to fix a bad motor program or to change the way you do you basically do something you know uh, I experienced that firsthand. I've changed the, the style of grip I used with the pistol three times in my shooting career. And it was a horrible experience every time I did it. The, the last one I went to, I basically had to, I basically created a huge nub on one side of the grip panel because I was trying to transition to the thumbs high grip that Tom teaches, right? And I just could not get my thumbs off the controls of my SIG. So literally I, uh, I made a prosthetic grip that physically hurt to have my thumb in the wrong spot. I then went and did a five day class at Thunder Ranch. And after, you know, five days of very negative reinforcement for the thumb in the incorrect position, I was able to ingrain that, but uh, it was, it was certainly a lot of work. All right. I, I also took my first formal firearms training in 1999. And at the time, what they were teaching us in law enforcement, at least here in Georgia was the very locked out, you know, extended, shoulders forward almost to the point of hyperextension uh, that is derisively referred to in the competitive circles as the tactical turtle. And uh, that's what was being taught uh, here at the Public Safety Training Center. And I actually learned that to a point of that was my default. Now, years later, I have learned that there perhaps there are better techniques. And I've been trying and working very diligently at uh, improving my stance and my technique. Uh, I'll go back and I'll look at pictures, say, from 2011, 2012 of me shooting compared to sh pictures and video now, and I see a difference. But sometimes when I get tired, like at the end of a two-day class, or I get really stressed or whatever, I find myself defaulting back to that original program. Uh, a great example of that, absolutely. All right, so if doing things repetitively builds motor programs. So does it stand to reason then that if you're doing things incorrectly, you're actually building the wrong types of motor programs? 
Well, well, absolutely, Maya. I think it was my friend Jim Higginbotham first said this is practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you repeatedly practice the wrong thing over and over again, you will become really good. You know, I think Tom has said, if you practice crap long enough, you'll become a crap master, right? And that's, I don't think that's any of our desired goals. Right. Um, you know, one of the things you hear commonly in class when someone is not performing and the instructor or the assistant step up and they, like, they try to coach the shooter is you'll get this response. But, but I've always done it this way. Well, you've always been doing it wrong. Yes, you've always sucked. Let's try to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> I just said you've always been doing it wrong. John was a much harsher individual than I, and so he went with other language there. Um, for that, I do have a, a caveat for instructors that I want you to be aware of that for any of you that are watching this. If someone has legitimately burned in motor programs, just like we saw with John in, in the video clip earlier, just because you're teaching a different technique and you coach the student on the line and they don't instantly perform that technique to perfection it doesn't mean that they're being resistant or that they're being a bad student it's just they may be fighting these motor programs uh, that they have built up and I, I can think of one experience in which i went to a a school that's been around for a long time and the instructor saw something that i did said hey try doing it this way and I intended to do it that way. The only thing was I didn't have a good friend standing behind me with a video camera to catch me reverting back to what I had previously been doing. And the instructor melted down on the range in front of the, the rest of the class. And I'm like, wow, that, that, uh, you know, I, I understand that I did not do what you said for me to do, but at the same time, I've actually done what I was doing to the point of learning it. And I'm just not trying to be resistant. So guys, for those of you that are on, on the line from the teaching standpoint, understand that if you have experienced students coming to you, that it's actually going to be pretty difficult for them to change immediately what they're doing. It's actually easier to teach the new students sometimes. John? Oh, absolutely. All right. So with all that said and done, how important is it for students to, to pick instructors it can be hugely important uh especially if you don't pick well um i think it was actually kathy jackson who noted that the most important classes out there are your basic introductory pistol classes because that's going to be the foundation you carry with you the rest of your life but those are the classes and i'm about to insult people that we tend to trust to the most shoddy kind of questionable instructors and when i say shoddy questionable instructors i'm talking about people who maybe have a two-day instructor background, somebody who has not involved themselves in a process of continuing ongoing education to improve themselves, right? And a lot of times that foundation will really limit you if you go back and you know try to improve yourself. Um, I, I, you and I both work in the law enforcement world. It's, it's the, the level of a lot of recruit training in law enforcement is horrendous because they're allowed to practice such poor sloppy techniques uh, to reach a mediocre score on a sobriety test qualification, that if you take that person and then really try to turn them into a performance pistol shooter, it's like, you know, you're, you're not in that process of, you know, building a motor program in 500 repetitions, you're much more in that 3,000 to 5,000 uh, repetitions to correct something that's been done incorrectly. And a lot of people simply aren't willing to do that level of work. And whether you're talking about a law enforcement officer or just somebody, you know, getting their you know their first ccw um how you interface the, the grip you use on the pistol how your you know your the platform you use to interface your body with the pistol on the ground all that stuff is going to be really important if we try to push anything beyond the most basic standards of mediocrity yeah i've assisted with a number of instructor level classes and occasionally when you see a student who's a prospective instructor candidate who their skills really aren't up to where I, you would think that someone that's going to teach would be and they'll they'll try to smooth things or, or provide a caveat they'll be like oh but but, but i'm just going to be teaching beginner classes so it's okay and, you know I, I just think back to what you just said there and i was familiar with kathy saying okay you're teaching beginning students this is where you need to be the most squared away this may be the only instruction a lot of people ever get in the safe handling of this pistol it should be pretty dang good there you go. 
John, any closing thoughts, anything that we didn't touch on that you would like to share? No, I just enjoy sitting here drinking iced tea with you, man, anytime. <laughs> uh, well, before we go, tell everybody about your company and your right. training that you're offering. So uh, 2021 was the rollout of my own independent training stuff. I'm in the process of coming up with a cool name and all that stuff. Uh, I'll be announcing soon, but for right now, uh, if you go to jhearn, J-H-E-A-R-N-E.com, that's my quick splash webpage that the beautiful, incredible Tiffany Johnson threw up for me. It's going to list my background, detailed instructions, uh, upcoming courses, that sort of thing. Uh, and again, that will be uh, up changing soon. But of course, if I tell you what the great new name is going to be, everybody will go and steal the URL. So, so I need to hold off. I can tell you that picking a name for your business is the hardest thing about starting a business. Uh, I've tried twice to pick a good name, and I still haven't picked one that's satisfactory <laughs> to me. Uh, occasionally, I come up with the great, oh, that's it. And I immediately go in a search and someone already has the name. And I came up with one here recently that I really wanted to use. And it's like some guy in some small town somewhere that I, like, how did you beat me to this name? It, this was great. And you're not doing anything with it. Uh, so good luck. I hope you get it right the first time. And um, oh, since we're talking about automaticity and motor programs, the chart that you came up with. Uh, so the chart, um, well, the chart was, uh, I didn't just come up with this. So first off, um, I, I talked to a lot of smart people that were engaged in that in the process of developing that chart. Um, it's not up right now, but I try to throw it up um, on the website, uh, jhearn.com. But it was basically, you know, kind of talking about common shooting standards and how likely you're able to perform a certain standard suggested automaticity. You know, there's some shooting standards that you don't have to, you know, you can sit there and very deliberately think your way through every action. And it doesn't imply any level of automaticity, but there is clearly at a certain point of performance. So let's say if you're uh, a build drill, for those that don't know, that's draw and fire six rounds to an A zone, either an eight inch target, eight inch circle, or a USPSA A zone um, as quickly as you can, right? So anytime you're doing that, especially from concealment under three seconds, that's a level of performance you're just not going to, you know, get on a lark. That's going to suggest that you've actually done a lot of work so that the draw draw stroke is automatic. The gun alignment is good. The trigger control is acceptable for what you're trying to do. So the whole the whole idea of the chart was just to kind of um, show where the sweet spot is. Because again, one of the problems is you can you can train to a literally a world class level, but that's not what most of us are going to do. What we most of us need to find out is that point of diminishing return. Where am I? What is the point where I'm probably good enough with my shooting that I can worry about other stuff other than just shooting? And it's it's always finding those points of diminishing returns that are the most frustrating. Okay, did, is that chart in the book that you wrote the chapter for, for you? I don't believe it is. Um, it's, uh, I, I will do my best to get up on the jhearn.com. Um, it's run around the internet in various forms. Um, it's in Carl, actually it's in Carl Wren's book, his standards of training. Uh, it is in, the, the chart is in that book. Uh, it's in, uh, I can't draw, I'm drawing a blank. I've got a copy somewhere behind me, Carl. I swear I do, but uh, I don't, uh, uh, I know it is in there. All right, if you go to krtraining.com, that's Carl Wren's training site, uh, there will be a link to where you can find that book. And it does have uh, a copy of the chart in there. I was going to get to that book as well. Uh, a thought just occurred to me. Wait, it's a miracle. Wow. wow. <laughs> you know, I, I'm done for the week because the thought just occurred to me. I, think I should have done this on Tuesday. Um, so should the chart maybe be a testing tool for a prospective instructor to look at to say, hey, are my skills to the point where maybe I should be thinking about teaching others or maybe I need to be worried about my own development before I'm teaching? Yeah, others. I think that's a, the chart or just some reasonable objective standard. There are several good standards out there because, you know, I, I, I think it, Carl, it was Carl that made this point that the first person you're going to coach is going to be yourself. And if you can't coach yourself to an adequate level of performance, you probably shouldn't be trying to coach others. You know, so um, you want a reasonable objective, you know, standard for instructors, you know, uh, Paul Howe is very clearly, you know, his, all his stuff. He posts what his standards are. You need to be able to pass eight of these 10 drills uh, at his instructor level. So certainly something at that level, you know, whether it's that or the FBI bullseye, there's some very clearly established standards out there that are, are actually on that chart that, uh, you know, show somebody where their actual performance is. Again, their objective uh, measure of their performance as opposed to their subjective feelings. 
All right, cool. John, any closing thoughts? No, I'm dead. Glad to be here with you. Let me know when you need something else. Absolutely. You were almost as good as Eric Gilhouse. Almost. I'll take that. Almost. Almost. All right. Well, thanks to John for uh, being with us today. And we hope that you get something out of it. And John, let me see if I can figure out how to stop this recording.